This question is saying, let's calculate the maximum height above the ground reached by block A. It sounds like a typical vertical projectile motion, but it is way, way, way more than that. You're going to see what I'm talking about when I answer the question. Can I even answer the question? That's the question on its own. Let's do 2.1 so that I can show you what I'm talking about. Uh, so 2.1, the question is saying that uh, let's show by means of calculation that the magnitude of the acceleration of block B was 3.88 meters per second squared while the block was moving vertically downwards. So let's go ahead and read our question statement so that we can see what is going on. So when block B is released, so now we know fully well that this block B is released at some point, it moves vertically downwards and strikes the ground with a velocity of 3.41 meters per second. So if it is released, then we know that VI is equals to 0 meters per second. And we're given VF, the velocity at which it strikes the ground. It is said to be 3.41 meters per second. What else do we have? Uh, we have uh, the distance or the displacement of uh, our object B, right? From the time it is released uh, to the time it strikes the ground. So we have delta Y being equals to 1.5 meters. And what are we looking for? We're looking for the acceleration, right? So based on the vertical projectile motion, you can see what we have to use here. Uh, VF squared is equals to vi squared plus 2a delta y uh, we have vf squared we have uh, vi we have delta y so we can use this formula for sure right it's gonna work because we're looking for the acceleration so let's take um let's take direction uh towards the ground as positive if we do that then our vf is three point 41 squared which is equals to our vi which is zero we square that plus 2a and then if we take in direction uh, towards the ground is positive then our delta y will be positive 1.5 we're gonna have 11 11.6281 when it goes to uh, zero squared is just zero right and then here we have 2 multiplied by a multiplied by 1.5. That is equals to 3a. So if we divide both sides by 3 in order to find our acceleration, uh, our acceleration is equals to 3.88 meters per second squared. Right. And that's exactly what we are asked to prove. So our answer for 2.1, we're quite confident uh, we're doing the right thing. And then now, 2.2 let's draw a free body diagram uh showing all for six acting on block b uh immediately after it was released right so let's just go ahead and do that so for block b we're gonna have the weight pointing downwards right and then now we can start thinking about everything else you know the weight is going to be there so you put the weight first and then after that you have to start thinking about everything else right it is connected to a light inextensible rope so we're supposed to have tangent force uh, going up right so we have uh, tension and weight we have two forces acting on the object and the equation also has two marks right so we're quite confident we were able to identify all the forces if the equation was out of three marks and we had only two forces we were most likely going to be doing something wrong right you should be aware of that and then 2.3 uh, this is the one I want you guys to do. Uh, state Newton's second law of motion in words, right? Uh, we know that the acceleration uh, is directly proportional to the F net and so on and so on. Let's just do 2.4, right? Before doing 2.5. Uh, so 2.4 is, is quite an interesting one also. It's saying that uh, let's conclude the value of M by applying Newton's second law. Uh, to each block while they are in motion. People are getting this question wrong so often such that they're telling you to apply Newton's second law in each block, right? They usually just say calculate the value of M and you have to figure it out yourself that you have to use uh, Newton's second law on both blocks. But then now they're actually telling you, let's go ahead and apply it on block B and see what's going to happen. So for block B, we have the free body diagram, right? So when I say uh, F net, is equals to 
M A. And then we're going to say the force that is pulling the object uh, minus the force that is opposing. The object is going down, right? So it means that we have the weight pulling our object and then the tangent is opposing. So we're going to say that the weight minus the tangent is equal to M A. So what is the weight? The weight is 7.5 multiplied by 9,8 minus tension is equal to the mass, which is 7.5 multiplied by our acceleration, which is 3.88. Uh, so what is 7.5 multiplied by 9.8? Uh, that is 73.5. And then minus tension is equal to 7.5 multiplied by 3.88. Uh, which is equal to 29.1 so minus tension will be equal to so now we take in this term here to the right hand side so that it will be 29.1 minus 73.5 uh, which is equal to minus uh, 44 minus 44.4 right so if we divide both sides by minus one we're gonna get the tension being equals to 44.4 newtons right we have the tension but that's not what we're looking for we're looking for the value of m right so now we have to go to that object so uh for object a uh, still f net is equals to M A, right? There's no other way. So let's have a free body diagram for object A so that we can see what is going on. So for object A, um, the tension is pulling the object upwards, right? And the weight is opposing. So here we must have tension minus the weight because now it is the tension that is pulling and the weight that is opposing, unlike in object A. Right, so the tension, we know that it is 44.4 minus the weight. The weight should be M multiplied by 9.8 is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration, which is 3.88. Right, so we're going to have 44.4 minus 9.8 M is equal to 3.88 M. It's easy to see that we're going to have 44.4 and then it's equal to, so we take in this term to the right hand side. So that is 3.88 plus 9.8, uh, which is equal to 13.68 uh, M. If we divide both sides by 13.68, we're going to have 44.4 uh, divided by uh 13.68 and then uh the size of our mass um our mass is 3.25 kgs right so we have our mass uh the value of m that is 2.4 and now uh 2.5 let's just do 2.5 real quick uh so let me show you something uh let's calculate the maximum height above the ground reached by m so initially i was thinking why does this question have five marks it should have one because from uh this point here to the ground it's 1.5 and then while b is uh, moving from that height to the ground then a will move from the ground to that height uh, which is 1.5 so the maximum height for a should be 1.5 why does it have five marks i don't understand but then i realized that um when it reaches uh this height which is 1.5 it has a velocity which is not equals to zero, right? So it's still going to go up for some time because this velocity there is not zero. So it's not stopping. It's still going up until it ultimately gets stopped by gravity, right? So what is the velocity at this point? That is the question we are interested in. Uh, the velocity at that point is equals to the velocity that uh, the object B strikes the ground with right and then what is the value of that uh, velocity that is 3.41 it is given to us here so at this point here at this height ball a has a velocity of 3.41 meters per second
I was not so sure about the velocity of A at that point. I actually calculated it. And then I realized that, okay, fine. Uh, the velocity at which ball B strikes the ground with is the velocity of ball A at that height. Because the acceleration is the same and then VF is not dependent on the mass. When we're using VF squared, it's equals to VI squared plus 2A delta Y. So we have the velocity at that point we want the maximum height about the ground right but then another thing we have is vf right which is at the maximum height we're interested in that vf is equals to zero because at that point your object will no longer be going up so if we find this height here and then we add it to the 1.5 we have then we have the height of object a above the ground so let's go ahead and do that we say that vi will be close to 3.41 meters per second and vf will be equals to zero right our acceleration how much will our acceleration be if we take upwards is positive our acceleration will be minus 9.8 meters per second that is because when ball b strikes the ground object a will now be in free fall the tangent force on that rope is going to be equals to zero right uh, so we have vi we have vf we have the acceleration we want uh delta y right so it's easy to see now that we can say that vf squared is equals to vi squared plus 2a delta y so vf is zero maximum height and then vi if we take it up as positive that is 3.41 squared plus 2 acceleration minus 9.8 because we take it up one is positive and then multiply by delta y so we have to take this term to the left hand side so 3.41 squared is equals to so 3.41 squared is equals to 11.6281 right if we take it to the other side we're gonna have minus 11.6281 being equals to 2 multiplied by minus 9.8 that is minus 19.6 delta y if we divide both sides by uh, minus 19.6 uh, we're gonna get 0 0.59 so 0 0.59 uh, meters is equals to delta y so here we have 1.5 and then here we have 0 0.59 so our height above ground so our height above ground is 1.5 plus 0 0.59 right that will be our height uh, that is equals to 2.09 meters Free fall is the motion of an object where the only force acting is gravity. Right, so that is 3.1. Let's go ahead and do 3.2.1. So the question is saying that let's calculate the time taken for ball A to strike uh, the ground. So let's look at ball A here. Uh, it is released uh, yeah, from a height of 15.2 meters above the ground. Uh, when it is released, we know fully well that VI is equal to 0 meters per second. Right, and we have delta Y. So let's take up as positive. If we take up as positive, then delta Y should be equal to minus 15.2 meters uh, when our object strikes uh, the ground. Uh, another information we have is the acceleration, as we always do minus 9.8 meters per second squared and what are we looking for we're looking for the time it takes um the ball to strike the ground right so based on the variables we have vi acceleration delta y and the time that we're looking for it's easy to see now that we're gonna say uh, delta y is equals to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared right initially i didn't want to use this formula because what about delta t squared and delta t i'm going to have to solve this uh, by factorizing right but then i realized that vi is equal to zero so this term here is going to give me zero i'm not going to have so many issues right so if we go ahead and substitute 
uh, we're going to get minus 15.82 is equals to vi which is zero right multiply by the time so that term falls away plus a half the acceleration is minus 9.8 and the time is what we're looking for so we're gonna have minus 15.2 being equals to this term falls away we just have minus 4.9 delta t squared so it's easy to see now that uh, delta t will be equals to uh, the square root of 15.2 divided by 4.9 nine right so now it's just a matter of uh, putting that in your calculator and what am i getting i'm getting 1.76126 seconds so that is the time it takes uh ball a to strike the ground right uh, it makes sense because it's gonna take about one second to cover 9.8 meters right and then the rest of um the height uh, can take less than a second right uh, let's do 3.2.2 so in 3.2.2 uh quite demanding one right uh five marks uh, we're looking for the magnitude of the velocity with which ball b was projected from the ground so let's look at the information we have um we don't have vi uh if you take the motion from the time it was projected to the maximum height you can say you have a vf which is equals to zero right but we don't know the maximum height also because at this point what we have is uh, the initial velocity uh which is unknown and the acceleration which is minus 9.8 meters per second squared and then another thing we can calculate is the time for the motion of ball b right because we are told that ball a and ball b they strike the ground at the same time but then when ball a was at this point that is only when ball b was projected upwards so we can say that uh, the total time the total time of uh, ball a minus the time taken by ball a to go from uh, maximum height to 3.2 meters uh, below the maximum height will give us the time for ball b <laughs> right so let's go ahead and do that let's go ahead and do that uh, so for ball b not ball b but ball a uh, we can say that um, delta y is equals to vi delta t plus a half a delta t squared right so now our delta y we can say that is minus 3.2 meters because we're looking for the time t again for only this journey that is the time we're interested in right we're going to subtract it from the total time and that will be the time for ball b right so if we substitute minus 3.2 then uh, our vi zero delta t plus a half minus 9.8 delta t squared right uh, so we're gonna have minus 3.2 being equals to minus 4.9 delta t squared if we make delta t the subject of the formula we're gonna get 3.2 divided by 4.9 uh, we know that um minus and minus uh they're gonna cancel out right and our time will be 0 0.8 so we have 0 0.8081 so right the time for this part of the motion uh, from this point to this point is 0 0.8081 right so to find the time uh, for the entire motion of ball b we can say that uh, so the time for ball b we're going to say that uh, it is equal to the total time for ball a which is 1.761 minus 0 0.8081 right so let me 
just put that in my calculator real quick so that I can see uh, what I get. I'm getting 0 0.95. Three one six uh, seconds. Right. So that is the total time for ball B. Let's revisit the information we have for ball B and see if we can manage to find that VI. Uh, we have the time for the total motion. Right. We can put that in mind. And then VI is still our unknown. We have the acceleration, which is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. But if we take the motion from the ground to the maximum height, we can say that we have VF, right? We have a VF, which is equal to zero. And then to find uh, the change in time from ground to zero, we're going to see total time divided by two. Because the time taken from ground to uh, the maximum height should be the same time from maximum height to the ground. It is actually wrong for me to put this dot here. We don't know how high ball B is above the ground at maximum height. Right. Uh, so if we divide that total time by two, so we have 0, 0.95316 divided by two. Uh, let me just put that in my calculator real quick. I'm getting 0 0.47658. So now I have uh, delta T. Uh, I have delta T. I have V. I, v I is what I'm looking for. I have acceleration. I have uh, VF. So it's easy to see now that I can say VF is equal to VI plus A delta T. VF is 0. VI is what we're interested in plus our acceleration, which is minus 9.8, multiplied by the time, which is 0 0.47658. So minus VI is going to be equal to, so I have minus 9.8 multiplied by 0 0.47658. All right, so I get uh, minus VI being equal to minus 4.6705. And then VI is equals to 4.6705 meters per second. Right, that is the initial velocity uh, for which uh, ball B is projected upwards. Now the last question, 3.3. So on the same system of axis, let's draw the position time graphs to show the motions of both ball A and B from the instant ball A is dropped until the time it reaches the ground uh, let's take the ground as the zero position right because usually they will say let's take the ground as our reference point and that will lead to a lot of ambiguity what do they mean you know reference point are we taking it as zero are we what is happening but then when they see we must take it as the zero position that is clear there's no ambiguity you know exactly what is expected of you Right, so the x axis, there we go. And then obviously on the x axis, we're gonna have the time in seconds. And on the y axis, we're gonna have um, uh, delta y in meters. Maximum height 15.2. So let's start with ball A, right? So ball A is starting from 15.2. And then it goes down until it starts the ground, right? Uh, it takes 1.76 seconds for that motion. So we have 1.76 seconds, right? And then now we have to go to ball, ball B. So ball B is only projected 0 0.8 seconds later. So we have 0 0.8 here. Right. Yeah, that is uh, the time at which is projected. And then it goes up uh, to its maximum height, which is less than that of all A. That's, yeah, it's easy to see. But then they strike the ground at the same time. So I think we should have something like this. I wonder what you guys did. Can you please let me know in the comments if we have the same position time graph.
The total linear momentum in an isolated system is conserved. That is uh, the principle of conservation of linear momentum in what's 4.1, right? So let's go ahead and do 4.2 and see what is happening here. Uh, so the first question 4.2.1 calculate the magnitude of the velocity of the trolleys immediately after the collision. So based on the principle of conservation of linear momentum, uh, we know that uh, the sum of the momentum before should be equals to the sum of the momentum after right if that system is isolated so for our case here we have trolley a uh, which is moving to the right and we have trolley b which is stationary and after they collide they move together as one unit right so if we set up our equation here we'll get m1 multiplied by the velocity plus m2 multiplied by its velocity being equals to m1 plus m2 multiplied by vf if you're confused and you can't see what is happening that is because the momentum is equal to the mass multiplied by the velocity so this right here is the momentum for uh, trolley a the momentum of trolley b and the momentum as they move together as one unit right so if we go ahead and substitute, we're going to get 7.2 multiplied by 0 0.4. We take in direction to the right is positive, right? Plus uh, the mass of uh, trolley B, which is 5.3 uh, multiplied by 0, right? It was stationary. And then this will be equals to uh, 7.2 plus 5.3 multiplied by the final velocity right so if i put 7.2 multiplied by 0 0.4 on my calculator uh, i'm getting 2.88 and 5.3 multiplied by 0 that will just be 0 right and that will all be equals to so now i have 7.2 plus 5.3 which is 12.5 so i have 12.5 multiplied by vf right it's easy to see now that i just need to divide both sides by 12.5 so if i divide uh, both sides by 12.5 uh, let me see what i get i'm getting 0 0.2304 meters per second being equals to vf so there we go, I have uh, the final velocity of the trolleys immediately after the collision. Right, and 4.2.2, let's calculate the magnitude of the average net force exerted by trolley A on trolley B during the collision if the collision time is 0 0.2 actually 0 0.02 seconds so there's two ways of doing this one you can say that f net is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time or you can say that f net is equal to the mass multiplied by acceleration they're all going to work but let's just use uh, the first one right if we use this first one uh, we know that the change first the change is equal to the mass multiply by vf minus vi right we're on the same page now we can go ahead and substitute so f net will be equals to uh, the mass so let's use trolley b right uh, you can use trolley a you're gonna get the same thing uh if we use trolley b we're gonna get the mass uh being equals to what is the mass again uh 5.3 and then vf is 0 0.2304 and then it's coming from rest so its vi must be zero and we divide in all that by 0 0.02 uh, that is uh, the m amount of time uh, the collision uh, took right and then uh, putting that in my calculator real quick i'm getting 61.056 it is a force in which the work done in moving an object between two points is dependent on the path taken. 
So that is 5.1, a non-conservative force. Right, and then 5.2, uh, let's use energy principles to calculate the speed of the creed when it reaches point C. Right, so let's see what's going on here. We have an electric motor that pulls a 20 kg creed from rest at point A, right? Uh, up the incline by means of a light inextensible rope. And then we can see that the incline makes an angle of 18 degrees. Uh, with the horizontal B, C, and D are points in the inclined plane. And then we can see clearly that the distance between A and B is 15.6 meters. Right, we are told that the motor exists a constant force of 96.8 newtons uh, parallel to the incline. And then there's a constant frictional force of 13.5 newtons. Right, so we're supposed to use energy principle. If the question says use energy principles, you can use work net is equal to the change in EK. Right, you can also use the work done by non conservative forces equals to the change in EK plus the change in EP. Right, you can do that. Uh, so let's just go ahead and solve it using uh, the first formula, right? I've actually solved it using both. So if you try this formula, it should also work. Right, so if you use that formula, we're going to get uh, F net multiplied by delta X multiplied by cos of theta when it goes to a half MVF squared minus a half mvi squared right so now we can find f net uh, so that uh, we can find vf ultimately right so how can we find f net let's draw a free body diagram of the 20 kg block as it moves up the incline right so we have fg parallel which is pushing the object down the incline we have uh, the frictional force, right? And then uh, the force applied uh, by the electric motor. We have the normal force, obviously. And we have the weight perpendicular, right? The normal force and the weight perpendicular are not going to do any work on the object. So we are interested on the force applied by the electric motor, frictional force, and FG parallel. So if we find the net force there, we're going to get uh, the net force when it goes to the force applied, which is 96.8, right? So we're going to have 96.8 uh, minus the forces that are opposing, frictional force, that is 13.5 minus Fg parallel. So Fg parallel is Mg sine of theta, right? So that is Fg parallel. And then if we substitute that in our equation, uh, the mass is 20 kgs. Uh, the acceleration is 9.8 and then multiply by sine of 18 degrees. So if we put that in our calculator, then F net should be whatever we get there. Right. So let me just uh, do that real quick so that we can see what we get. And then I think uh, our F net should be equals to uh, 22.73. 27 newtons right so now we have f net we can put it in our equation so in place of f net we now put in 22.7327 right and then in place of delta x we have 15.6 and then uh, the object is moving up the incline and the f net is also pointing up the incline so the angle in between those two should be zero right so we're going to have cos of zero, uh, being equals to a half. Uh, the mass is 20 kgs multiplied by Vf squared minus a half. 20, uh, velocity initial, our object is coming from rest, right? So multiply by zero squared. Right, so let me just uh, solve the left-hand side. And uh, 22.7327 multiply by 15.6, multiply by 1, uh, what am I getting? Uh, I'm getting 354.6301 uh, 
is equal to so i have multiplied by 20 that will be 10 right and then we have vf squared right so if we apply a bit of algebra here and make vf the subject of the formula uh, we're gonna get the square root of uh, 354.6301 divided by 10 right so now what is left i just need to put that in my calculator and our vf is 5.96 meters per second right uh, that is 30 point not 3 but 5.2 right let's move to 5.3 uh, so 5.3 is saying that uh, let's calculate the minimum average power dissipated by the electric motor to pull the grid from point a to point c so if we want to find the power, you say that we can use the work divided by uh, the time, or we can use uh, the force multiplied by uh, the average velocity, right? We, we we don't have the time as it is, right? Uh, maybe we can try calculate the work, but we don't have the time. But then if you look at the other formula, uh, we have the force, right? That is exerted by our electric motor, right? And then we have VI, which is equal to zero, and we have VF, which is equal to 5.96. So we can add those two and divide by two to find velocity average, right? So what I'm saying, I'm saying that uh, the power will be equals to so the force that is exerted by uh, our motto that is 96.8 multiplied by a uh, velocity average so i'm saying to find velocity average i'm going to say vf plus vi divided by two so what is vf vf is 5.96 and then plus zero divided by two right so uh, that is 96.8 multiplied by 5.96 plus 0 divided by divided by 2 and then the answer i'm getting here is 288.464 what is the si unit of power gain i think it's i think it's what right so we're gonna have that there i'm so much interested in how other people solved this problem so please just let me know in the comments what you did for 5.3 then uh 5.5.4 5 uh 5.4 is saying that when the grid reaches point c the rope breaks so our rope is breaking at this point you know at c and then what happens next uh, the grid continues uh, moving up the inclined plane as you would expect uh, it comes to a stop at point d and then slides down the plane past point b right draw a label free body diagram for the grid as it slides down the plane past point b right so it's like it's sliding down and we need to draw a free body diagram for that motion uh, so when it is sliding down um fg parallel is still down the incline fg parallel is down the incline and then uh, the frictional force is now up the incline right and then we have our normal force there and we have our weight perpendicular or fg uh perpendicular right so i'm expecting one two three um, i'm expecting this question to be out of three marks because we have identified three forces right and indeed it is right so now i'm convinced that uh, i have the correct free body diagram because my number of forces correlates with uh the marks uh, for the equation right and then uh, 5.5 let's look at what 5.5 says so in 5.5 uh, let's do a velocity time graph for the entire motion of the grid um starting from point a until it passes point b and again on its motion down the inclined plane right well so we study that v is equal to zero and then at point b at point b uh we have not at point b but at point c we have uh, a velocity of 5.95 meters so let's write uh 5.95 here and then 
right let's have our vt graph yeah so there we go there we go to 5.95 and then what happens after we reach a velocity of 5.95 so the rope breaks and then when the rope breaks we no longer have that force that is pulling uh, our object but then our object will go up for some time before it reaches uh, a vf of zero right as it is going up its velocity is decreasing until it reaches zero right so let's see if we can we can indicate that in our graph so it decreases until uh, it reaches v is equals to zero right that is now we add point d we have reached v is equal to zero because it's going to be increasing bit by bit bit by bit until we reach v is equal to zero and then after that point now it is going down right our object is going down and this velocity is starting to increase right so i'm thinking that we're gonna have yeah something like this this velocity is starting to increase now all right so i'm thinking we're gonna have something like that until we reach point a again we don't know the velocity of point a i don't think we need to indicate uh the value anyway right i'm quite interested on how yours look like can you please just let me know in the comments if we have anything similar One of the most interesting questions on La Dobla effect I've came across, that is 6.1.2, right? Uh, so let's look at 6.1.1. You just need to state the definition of Dobla effect in once, right? I'm sure you can do that. Let's look at 6.1.2, the interesting question. So the question is saying, a car moves at a constant velocity of 22 meters per second on a straight horizontal road towards a stationary device, which can both emit and detect sound waves. The device emits sound waves with a frequency of 24,000 hertz. All right. And then these sound waves are reflected of the car and the reflected sound waves are then detected by the device as shown in the diagram below. Uh, we can see what is happening there. And then if the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second, let's calculate the frequency of the reflected sound waves detected by the device. So let's do a bit of conceptualization here. So let's put uh, X as our vehicle and put um, our device somewhere here. So the first thing that is going to happen, our device is emitting a sound wave, right? So let's just denote that. So we have some frequency of source. And then when it strikes the car, it's no longer FS. We now have FL, right? Is going to uh, experience, is going to detect a totally different frequency. And then from that frequency it detects, it's now going to reflect it and send it back to the device. So now we have this frequency being reflected back to the device. And then now we have FLQ. So you can use this FS here to find fl and then when you find that fl it now becomes your fs that the device is going to detect am i making any sense let me let me show you what's going on let me show you what's going on so for the first part we have the frequency of the listener being equals to v plus or minus uh, the velocity of the listener divided by v plus or minus the velocity of the source multiplied by the frequency emitted by the sound source right so the frequency observed by the listener or the frequency that strikes our vehicle it will be close to 340 and then our listener or our vehicle is moving towards the device right so we suppose you have plus uh, the velocity of our listener which is uh, 22 meters per second and then we can divide everything by 340 plus or minus 
the velocity of the device, which is zero, right? It is stationary. And then we can multiply that uh, by the frequency emitted by our device, which is 24,000. Right, so let me just uh, compute that real quick. So I have 340 plus 22 divided by 340 essentially multiplied by 24,000 and I'm getting 25,552.94 hertz. So this is the frequency that strikes our car. This is the frequency that strikes our car. And now this frequency is reflected back to the device as FS, right? This frequency now becomes our FS is reflected back to our device. Uh, so what am I saying? We say that now we're gonna have FL being equals to V plus or minus VL divided by V plus or minus VS multiplied by the frequency emitted by the source. So what is FL? FL is what we're looking for. The frequency uh, that is detected by the device, right? After it has been reflected, right? That will be equals to 340. And then now our listener is the device. We know that it is stationary. So we're going to have plus or minus zero divided by 340 and then now our sound source is moving towards it is the car right so we're gonna have 340 minus 22 multiplied by the frequency of the source which is what we calculated here 25,552.94 hertz that is the frequency that is being reflected by the car this is the trick of the question. As soon as you can wrap your head around the concept, then you're essentially done. So multiplied by uh, 25,552.94 hertz. I'm getting uh, 27,320.75 hertz. Right, so that is the frequency of the reflected sound waves detected by the device right and the last question uh 6.2 uh the spectral lines observed for a distant star show that the star is moving away from earth explain by referring to frequency how one can deduce that the star is moving away from the earth so here i'm you know much interested in how you guys answer this question so can you please just let me know in the comment section what happens when you have a positive and a negative charge, right? We have two unlike charges they are definitely going to attract, right? So the answer to 7.2 will be something like the following. We suppose to draw the net electric field pattern due to the two point charges. And now uh, 7.3, we need to calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force that y exists on x right so we have y and x right there uh, so f is equals to k q1 q2 divided by r squared so what is the value of k k is a constant right so we have 9 times 10 to the power of 9 and then q1 we can take x as q1 but when you substitute you don't put the negative sign you just put uh, the magnitude which is 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9 multiplied by q2 which is also 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9 so we can just say 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9 uh, squared right and then divided by the distance between the two charges so we have 0 0.03 and then we can square that 5.18 times 10 to the power minus 4 newtons right so yeah there we go uh, let's move to the next question and see what we can do so 7.7.4 Let's do a labeled vector diagram to show the directions of the electric fields at the point where X is positioned. Right. 
So in our question statement, we are told that a third point charge Z of unknown positive charge. So we have a positive right here. And then it is placed uh, 0 0.01 meters to the left of point charge X on the line joining point charges X and Y, uh, as we can clearly see. Right. So we need to draw a labeled vector diagram to show the directions of the electric field uh, at the point where X is positioned. Right. So let's say X is positioned somewhere here we're gonna have an electric field as a consequence of our charge z right so let's call it e1 pointing to the right and then the electric field due to y is gonna be to the left right so we have uh, something like that for 7.4 7 7.5 it says that the magnitude of the resultant electric field at the point where x is positioned is 4.91 times 10 to the 5 newtons per column. Let's calculate the magnitude of charge z. So the resultant electric field will be equal to E1 minus E2, right? As we can see that. Uh, they are pointing in opposite directions. So in it is 4.91 times 10 to the power 5. And then E1, we don't have E1, right? Uh, that is what we're going to use to find uh, the charge of Z. So we have E1 minus E2. So we're going to have K. Let's not forget that E is equal to K. Q divided by R squared, right? So we're going to have 9 times 10 to the power 9 multiplied by 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by the distance, right? From here to here is 0 0.03 squared. So we have is 0 0.03, right? So we're going to have 0 0.03 squared right so we're gonna have 4.91 times 10 to the power 5 plus 9 times 10 to the power 9 multiplied by 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9 everything divided by 0 0.03 squared and this will be equals to e1 Right, so instead of writing E1, let's go ahead and substitute, right? So we're going to have 4.91 times 10 to the power 5 plus 9 times 10 to the power 9 multiplied by 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9. Uh, everything divided by 0 0.03 squared. And then this will be equals to 9 times 10 to the power 9 multiply by the charge of z divided by the distance so the distance from z to x uh, is 0 0.01 meters right so we're gonna have 0 0.01 meters and we can square that on the left hand side i have um 5.63 times 10 to the power 5 uh, this is equals to 9 times 10 to the power 9 multiplied by the charge of z divided by 0 0.01 squared right so the charge on z will be equals to 5.63 times 10 to the power 5 everything divided by 9 times 10 to the power 9 divided by 0 0.01 uh, squared right and then ultimately uh, we're going to get 6.26 times 10 to the have you ever calculated the emf using simultaneous equations that's what we're going to do for this question right look at 8.3 we have to calculate the EMF, but we don't have 
the internal resistance right but before we do that let's do 8.2 so 8.2.1 uh we're looking for the reading on the voltmeter so our voltmeter is connected across this 3 ohm resistor right as you can clearly see so what you have to realize here is that the current splits at this point so we have two parallel paths uh, these two resistors the 2 and the 5 are parallel to the 3 ohm resistor and then what do we know about resistors in parallel we know that the voltage is the same but the current is different right so to find the reading on uh, the voltmeter we can actually use this current we are given in a1 and multiply it by the resistance of these two resistors we can find the vp by doing that right we know that if we do that it's going to be the same value uh, that is in the voltmeter because the 3 ohm resistor is in parallel with the 2 and the 5 ohm resistor right so what are we saying we're saying that uh, we can have vp is equal to i multiplied by r so vp will be equals to 1.5 multiplied by 7 right pretty much uh, straightforward no complications uh, whatsoever and then if you put that in a calculator you should get 10.5 so the answer here for 8.2.1 we have 10.5 volts that will be the reading on the voltmeter right uh, let's move forward and do 8.2.2 what are we looking for we're looking for the reading on ammeter a2 so right if we go to our sketch you're gonna realize that ammeter a2 it's here right so basically what we're looking for is the total current because uh, ammeter a2 experiences total current so we're looking for it what do we have up to so far uh, we have vp which is equal to 10.5 volts what we're looking for is it right but then we have a formula that says that uh, vp is equals to it multiplied by rp so since we have vp we can find rp and then by doing that we will ultimately find it so let's go ahead and find uh, the resistance in parallel uh, we can say that one divided by rp is equals to one divided by r1 plus one divided by r2 so rp is equals to one divided by the total resistance on this path which is three ohms right plus one divided by the total resistance on this path which is two plus five so we're supposed to have two plus five here to the power minus one and then if you put that in your calculator you're going to get 2.1 ohms right so now we have rp we can then say that our vp is equals to it multiplied by rp so vp is 10.5 and then it is what we're looking for but what is rp rp is 2.1 it's easy to see now that uh, it will be equals to 10.5 divided by 2.1 which is equals to 5 amperes right so the value of it is 5 amperes right uh, let's move to the following question we're looking for the power dissipated in the 3 ohm resistor so to determine uh, power there's quite a few formulas we can use we can say that p is equal to v squared divided by r it is equal to v multiplied by r uh, by i or it is equal to i squared multiplied by r so let's see if we can use the first formula we have the voltage it is 10.5 volts and then we have the resistance which is 3 so we can use this formula we don't have to try use any other thing so we're gonna have p being equal to what is the voltage 10.5 then we square that divided by the resistance which is uh, 3 ohms right so now it's just a matter of putting that in your calculator and then when i do that what i'm getting i'm getting 36.75 so i have 
uh, watts, right? That is 8.2.3. Uh, the question we're really interested in is 8.3. So in 8.3, we're told that switch S1 is now open while switch S2 remains closed. The reading on the ammeter E2 is now 3.64 amperes. So when S1 is open, now we have an IT which is equals to uh, 3.64 ampere. We have a total current which is equals to 3.64. So let's go to our sketch and see what happens when switch S1 is open. So when switch S1 is open, the current is no longer passing this point, right? So basically, uh, all the current is going to flow like this. All the current is going to pass through the 3 ohm resistor. Right, so now our total resistance is 3 ohm. So to calculate the EMF, we can say that EMF is equal to I multiplied by R plus uh, the internal resistance. So our EMF will be equal to the current, which is 3.64, multiplied by the external resistance, which is 3 ohms, right, plus the internal uh, resistance. So EMF is equal to so we have 3.64 multiplied by 3, uh, which will give us 10.92 plus 3.64 R. As you can see, we're looking for the EMF, but we don't have the internal resistance. So we're stuck. We have one equation and two variables. So we can call this equation 1 and go ahead and try find um, another equation so that we can solve simultaneously. So this is when IT is equals to 3.64 ampere. But what happens when IT is equals to 5 amperes? Like we had uh, when both switch S1 and S2 are closed, right? So now we can use this information. We know that the uh, corresponding current is 5 ampere, right? So we're going to say that EMF is equal to I multiplied by R plus internal resistance again. So the EMF is equal to the current, which is 5 amperes when both switches are closed, multiplied by uh, the external resistance, uh, which is RP, right? Uh, that was 2.1, and then plus internal resistance. So the EMF is equal to 10.5 plus 5R equation 2. So we can equate these two equations and determine um, the internal resistance and ultimately uh, the EMF. So equation 2 is equal to equation 1. So what are we saying? We're saying that 10.5 plus 5R should be equal to 10.92 plus 3.64R. Right, so let's take uh, 10.5 to the right hand side and take 3.64 R to the left hand side. So if we take um, 3.64 R to the left hand side, we're going to get 1.36 R. And then when we take 10.5, to the right hand side we're gonna get 0.42 so r is equals to 0.4 q divided by 1.36 and that is equals to 0.31 uh, actually not 0.31 but 0 0.3088 ohms right so we have the internal resistance we can substitute it into either equation one or two to find our emf so if we substitute it in equation two we're gonna get 10.5 plus 5 multiplied by 0 0.3088 right so we have 10.5 plus 5 multiplied by 0 0.3088 uh, i'm getting 12.044 so 12.044 volts uh, seems to be our EMF, right? And now uh, this trick equation 8.4 is actually out of four marks. 
So what is it saying? We have uh, switch S2 is now opened while switch S1 is closed. So let's go ahead and make that adjustment. S2 is now opened. So S2 is now opened. The 3 ohm resistor is no longer taking part in our circuit. We can essentially just erase this. Yeah, we no longer have that when switch S2 is now open. How does the voltmeter reading change? Um, actually, let's not erase it because now we cannot see our voltmeter. Uh, so let's just erase S2 alone. Let's just erase S2 alone. Right. Yeah. Mm, there we go. How does the voltmeter reading change? Choose from increase, decrease, or remain the same. So the voltmeter is reading V external, right? So what will happen to V external when that switch is open? The first thing to realize is that R external, R external increases. That's what's going to happen when uh, that switch is open. Uh, R external is going to increase. But if R external increases, and we know that I is equal to V divided by R, then current, current decreases, current decreases. Uh, if current decreases, and let me show you something, EMF is equal to I multiplied by R plus I multiplied by the internal resistance. If the current uh, decreases, and then uh, our internal resistance stays the same, then V internal is going to decrease, right? Uh, v internal, V internal decreases, V internal decreases. But we need EMF to stay the same. We need EMF to stay the same. So to combat a decrease in the uh, internal uh, potential difference, V external increases, V external increases, V external increases. So the answer that we're looking for here in 8.4 is actually increases, right? Um, the reading on the voltmeter will increase.